Hello students, my name is Abhishek Sudhir. Welcome to EPG Patshala. Today, we'll be looking at module 9, Evolution of the Right to Life, which forms a part of paper number 4, Civil and Political Rights. The right to life is based on the belief that every human being has the innate fundamental right to live. This is as basic as it gets. The right to life should not be unjustly restricted or curbed by another human being. More importantly, the right to life, as much as possible, should never be curbed by the state. Now, what that brings to mind is issues like euthanasia, capital punishment, abortion, self-defense, war, situations where the taking of another individual's life by the state or by another individual is justified. In this module, we will look at the historical genesis of the right to life and the value on life that was placed by state and non-state actors. The module will trace the historical development of the right to life by chronicling developments pre and post the American Revolution. The American Revolution was the beginning of the overt state recognition of the right to life, especially in a democracy. That's why it's helpful if we chart the developments pre-American Revolution and post the American Revolution. Now, what are the learning outcomes of this module? Well, there are two learning outcomes. The first one is to demonstrate an understanding of the normative and historical origins of the fundamental right to life and personal liberty. The second learning outcome is to help the student understand the manner in which the right to life and personal liberty has developed through centuries and through political and apolitical discourses. Now let's begin with the developments predating the American Revolution. Let's start with the Polika Statute. The history of the right to life can be traced back as far as to the Statute of the Principality of Polika in the 1440s. Polika was a region that straddled the Kingdom of Croatia and the Republic of Venice. Act, acting as an edifice to the wish of the people of Polis, the Polika Statute was enacted to ensure independence from the Kingdom of Croatia and the Republic of Venice. The Polika Statute serves as the starting point for the discussion of human rights. For the first time in human history, the right to life was recognized under a written statute with the words that everyone held a right to live, for nothing existed since ever. In the common law world, essentially those countries in the world that follow British law or English law, the Magna Carta is considered the mother statute of all human rights. In 2015, after King John of England violated a number of ancient laws and customs of England, the people revolted. His subjects forced him to sign the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta enumerates what later came to be thought of as human rights. Of course, when the Magna Carta came into existence, there was no such concept of human rights. So it was up to the subjects and primarily the feudal lords, if you believe, of England to draft the Magna Carta. The driving force behind the Magna Carta was the landed class or the feudal class or the landowners in England who were upset with King John's arbitrary policies. Therefore, they came up with this Magna Carta, which essentially laid down the rights of the subjects and the duties of the sovereign, the king, and when the sovereign could not actually violate the rights of the citizens. Among some of these rights enumerated in the Magna Carta was the right of the church to be free from governmental interference, and the rights of all free citizens to own and inherit property, and to be protected from excessive taxes. Now you might wonder, taxes, property, should these actually form a part of the human rights and a part of the Magna Carta? Well then ask yourself this, who was the driving force behind the Magna Carta? It was the landed feudal class. Therefore, the landed class essentially wanted freedom from the sovereign. They were burdened with excessive taxes and whenever matters of money are involved, emotions run high. The feudal class were able to whip up sentiment against King John and essentially forced him to sign the Magna Carta, which guaranteed all citizens the right to own and inherit property and, of course, to be protected from excessive taxes imposed by the sovereign. The Magna Carta established the right of widows who own property to choose not to remarry. The Magna Carta established 
principles of due process, principles of equality before the law. It also contained provisions forbidding, forbidding bribery and official misconduct. In the 13th century, these concepts were revolutionary. Look at the principle of equality. Way back then, there, were, there was discrimination on the basis of religion. In our very own country, in India, there was discrimination on the basis of caste. And yet, the Magna Carta emphasized equality. It emphasized due process. What that essentially means is no person shall be deprived of his life or property in certain scenarios except by due process of the law. The Magna Carta did not impose an absolute bar on deprivation of property or life. What the Magna Carta did was that any such deprivation would have to be done in accordance with an established procedure. The Magna Carta is widely viewed as one of the most important legal documents in the development of a modern democratic state. You will find the world over where countries that follow the common law, countries that follow English laws or have laws that were drafted by, the, by, by lawyers and by lawmakers from the United Kingdom, the Magna Carta is considered the parent statute. The Magna Carta was a crucial turning point in the struggle to establish freedom. Now let's come to the petition of right. Some 400 years after the Magna Carta, the next recorded milestone in the development of human rights was the petition of right. The petition of right was drafted and produced in 1628 by the English Parliament. During 1628, Charles I was the ruling monarch of the United Kingdom. Parliament refused to finance Charles I's misadventures. Parliament was dissatisfied with his foreign policy. It, times were tough. The economy was stagnant. And here was the sovereign, the King Charles I, gallivanting across Europe and investing in foolhardy measures. The refusal by Parliament to finance the King's unpopular foreign policy had caused the government to exact forced loans and to quarter troops in subjects' houses as an economy measure, as an economic measure. What this basically meant was Charles I was forcing common citizens to accommodate members of the forces, armed forces, the quarter, the troops in their houses. Loans were taken. The country was in a downward spiral. Arbitrary arrest and imprisonment for opposing these policies had produced in Parliament a violent hostility to Charles I and also produced a significant amount of hostility towards George Villiers, the Duke of Buckingham. Arbitrary arrest and imprisonment are at the very heart and soul of the right to life. If somebody can be arrested arbitrarily, then what is the point of having the right to life? That was at the core of the petition of right. Now let's look at some of the clauses and some of the articles of the petition of right. The petition of right was initiated by Sir Edward Coke, a member of parliament, and was based upon earlier statutes and charters. The petition of right asserted four primary principles. No taxes may be levied without the consent of parliament. Taxes again. No subject may be imprisonment, no subject, sorry, apologies, no subject may be imprisoned without cause shown. Now this is interesting. What you see on, on a daily basis and what you hear is a show cause notice. This is essentially traced back to the petition of right, where it says no subject may be imprisonment without, imprisoned without cause shown. This is again a reaffirmation of the right of habeas corpus. Habeas corpus, students of law will be aware, is essentially a Latin maxim which means you shall produce the body. In India, if you are arrested, you must be produced before a judicial authority, a magistrate within 24 hours. At the core of this rule is the idea of habeas corpus. Now let's come to the third principle. No soldiers may be quartered upon the citizenry. This was one of the primary reasons the Petition of Right was drafted and produced in the first place. Therefore, one of the principles of the Petition of Right passed by Parliament simply said that no soldiers may be quartered upon the citizenry. The citizenry had enough uh, had enough trouble on their hands trying to feed their own children and now to impose soldiers and troops upon them was a gross violation of their right to a life and livelihood. Finally, 
the Petition of Rights stated that martial law may not be used in a time of peace. And this was key. This was essentially what Charles I was doing. Quartering of troops in subjects' houses was permissible, provided the realm or the country was under attack. But if this was not the case, then the Petition of Rights said martial law may not be imposed in a time of peace. Now let's come to the developments since the American Revolution. You are here looking at an artifact of the American Declaration of Independence. Following the Magna Carta, the next landmark moment in human history concerning the right to life was the passing of the American Declaration of Independence. The American Declaration of Independence was approved by the US Congress on the 4th of July. Philosophically, the Declaration of American Independence stressed two primary themes. The first, individual rights, and the second being the right of revolution. Let us look at the theme of individual rights. The United States today is still a bastion of individualism. It's the one country in the world that places a premium on individualism over collectivism. Now, the United States, the US, the American Declaration of Independence, also stressed the theme of the right of revolution. And the citizenry in the 13 colonies of the United States decided to take up arms against the king, the crown, and the British Empire, and won. This idea of revolution and individual rights influenced various movements across the world, and in particular, the French Revolution. Let's now look and the text of the American Declaration of Independence. The American Declaration of Independence states, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The text of this declaration is widely quoted today and has been reproduced albeit in a different form and manner, in various constitutions around the world. Let's reread this text of the Declaration and break it down. The Declaration states, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Essentially, they believe that these truths, what they are about to say, is self-evident. It is known, there is no need for further justification. There is no need for empirical evidence. Human beings have these rights, by virtue of being human beings, they are natural rights. What are these natural rights? Well, the Declaration states that all men are created equal. That's the principle of equality. They also state that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Here, a reference to God, but one could say maybe not God, simply says their creator. Therefore, an assumption at play that man was created. And think about the Polaika statute that we did in the beginning, which says that nothing existed since ever. So when you come, when man came into existence, you know, how he came into existence doesn't matter. Where he was born doesn't matter. How he believes or other people believe he or she came into existence doesn't matter. All that matters is that all men are created equal. And here the reference can also be to women and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And what are these unalienable rights? Well, these unalienable rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Here, once again, we see the principle of the right to life being enshrined. And interestingly enough, the words, the pursuit of happiness. The United States of America is one of a handful of countries that actually overtly recognizes an individual's right to pursue happiness. The other is one of India's own neighbors, Bhutan, that actually has a gross national happiness index. Therefore, the American Declaration clearly states that it's not just the right to life, but you have the right to pursue a better quality of life, a better standard of life. And interestingly enough, at the time that this declaration was passed, women were not given the right to vote in the United States. African Americans weren't even treated as men and women. They were treated as chattel. They were treated as property. Therefore, one could say that the framers of this declaration were at some level hypocrites. However, one has to go beyond that, go beyond the circumstances of the time that the declaration was passed. And if the text of this declaration is viewed in isolation, one can clearly see that certain 
cardinal principles that are central to the idea of human rights and are, that are central to human rights theory and jurisprudence were given a form, a shape, a manner in this declaration. Life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Now let's come to the Bill of Rights. Written during the summer of 1787 in Philadelphia, the Constitution of the United States of America is the fundamental law of the US federal system of government and is the landmark document of the Western world. The United States Constitution is the oldest written national constitution in use and ergo the United States is the oldest democracy as well. The US Constitution defines the principal organs of government and their jurisdiction and the basic rights of citizens. The first 10 amendments to the Constitution. An amendment to the Constitution essentially means a change to the Constitution. The first 10 changes, the first 10 amendments are collectively known as the Bill of Rights and they came into effect on December 15, 1791, limiting the powers of the federal government of the United States and protecting the rights of all citizens, residents and visitors in American territory, on American territory. You are here looking at an artifact of the Bill of Rights. Now, let's get into the nuts and bolts of the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights protects freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the right to keep and bear arms, the freedom of assembly, and the freedom to petition. Let me repeat that. The freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the right to keep and bear arms, the freedom of assembly, and the freedom to petition. Now you might wonder that there is no reference to the right to life. Well, there is no overt reference, but we now come to the rest of the rights, which says unreasonable search and seizure, cruel and unusual punishment, and self-incrimination are prohibited. It is here that the right to life comes into play. Cruel and unusual punishment. The reference very clearly here is perhaps to capital punishment, but the Supreme Court of the United States has subsequently held that the death penalty is constitutional. So what constitutes cruel and unusual punishment? Let's take the example of certain Arab countries where there are punishments such as castration. That would be a cruel and unusual punishment. And the United States Constitution prohibits punishments such as castration for people committing, let us say, a, a crime that is sexual in nature. The US Constitution also prevents compelled self-incrimination. What that essentially means is no person can be compelled, no person can be forced to be a witness against themselves. Every person has the right to remain silent in the United States when confronted with an accusation, a criminal charge. Among the legal protections that the Bill of Rights affords, with the primary prime among them is the prohibition on Congress from making any law respecting establishment of religion, which has been covered in previous modules. It also prohibits, more importantly, for our purposes here, it prohibits the federal government from depriving any person of life, liberty or property without the due process of law. Let me repeat. The Bill of Rights prohibits the federal government from depriving any person of life, liberty or property without due process of law. This, law, this clause has come to be known popularly as the due process clause. And what that essentially means is that if you're depriving an individual of his life, you are sentencing him to death, that procedure must be a due procedure, a due process, a procedure that flows from Congress, a procedure that has the sanction of the sovereign. That procedure must be a due process. That process must be fair, that process must be just, and that process must be reasonable. You cannot simply say, that everybody is presumed guilty until proven innocent. That would not be due process of law. Now, let's continue with the Bill of Rights. It also says that in criminal cases, there is a requirement of an indictment 
by a grand jury for any capital offense. Now, an indictment is essentially a charge sheet, a charge sheet whereby there is a piece of paper, a document that has been prepared by the investigating agency in conjunction with the prosecuting agency and the accused is confronted with this indictment. In the United States, even to have a trial in certain cases, especially in cases where it is a capital punishment, where capital punishment is available, there must be a grand jury indictment. A grand jury essentially is a jury made up of ordinary citizens who will decide whether there is a case to be made out against a particular individual and whether this individual should undergo a trial. Remember that this requirement is for offenses that are punishable with death, capital punishment. The Federal, uh, the Bill of Rights also guarantees a grand jury indictment for infamous crimes and guarantees a speedy public trial with an impartial jury. This is very important. The Bill of Rights here is alluding to the cardinal principle of law that justice must not only be done, but justice must also seem to be done, be seen to be done. What that means is that there is no point saying justice was done behind closed doors. The citizenry, the public, as a general rule, must be allowed to come and witness a trial if it chooses to. That trial must be a speedy trial. It cannot take years and years, which is unfortunately the case in our country. It must be speedy and it must be with an impartial jury. For example, let us assume A has murdered B and is accused of murdering B. You cannot have B's relatives C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O on the jury. The jury must be impartial. The jury must not be connected to the case in any way because at the end of the day, if the jury finds the accused guilty, and it is likely to do so, almost certain to do so if it is not an impartial jury, then the individual will be deprived of his right to life. He will be deprived of his life itself if the punishment is death. And he will be deprived of his liberty if the punishment is a term of imprisonment. Therefore, that procedure must be just fair and reasonable. That procedure is a speedy trial with an impartial jury. And the trial, according to the Bill of Rights, must take place in the district, in the jurisdiction where the crime occurred, where the crime took place, where the crime was committed rather. And it also, interestingly enough, prohibits double jeopardy. Those of you who are interested in this topic can go watch a very famous American film called Double Jeopardy. The principle of double jeopardy simply states that an individual cannot be tried twice for committing the same crime offense. So, let us assume that A is accused of murdering B. B's body cannot be found, but there is still an indictment by a grand jury and a trial takes place and A is acquitted of murdering B. It then so happens that B turns up again, alive. In a scenario like that, A then murders B, let us say. Or let us assume that B goes missing again. What the principle of double jeopardy basically states is that A cannot be tried again for murdering B. Just quickly to recap, A is accused of murdering B. A trial takes place, A is acquitted. B turns up again and A cannot be tried again for murdering B. A cannot be tried twice for committing the same offense on the basis of the same facts. This essentially prevents the state from hounding individuals. Let us assume that the state wants a conviction against individual A. Individual A is acquitted. The state is prohibited from the Bill of, by the Bill of Rights to accuse A again and try A again for committing the same offense. That is the principle of double jeopardy in a nutshell. You are here looking at an artifact of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, which is one of the founding charters of the French Republic. Now let's come to the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. 
a fundamental document of the French Revolution. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen came at a critical point in the history of human rights, in, a, in as much as it was the first instance wherein civil and political rights were concretized. The concepts in the Declaration were heavily influenced by the philosophical and political duties of the Enlightenment. Now let me tell you a little bit about the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment took place at, between the 1650s and the 1780s, a period of 130 to 140 years in Europe. This was a revolutionary period in human history. Ideas of church, ideas of God, ideas surrounding science were all challenged and the Enlightenment was a movement that sought to move away from having God as the center of the universe to reason, fact, analysis as being the center of the universe. Some of the great figures of the Enlightenment were some philosophers and scientists that many of you might have heard of. The Enlightenment stressed the need for individuality. One of the other founding member, the driving forces behind the Enlightenment was the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And it was Rousseau's social contract that formed the basis of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. Another driving force of the Enlightenment was Baron de Montesquieu, whose famous theory of the separation of powers was also given effect to in the Declaration of the Rights of Man. The French Declaration, as I've said, was also influenced by the US Declaration of Independence, which preceded it. The Declaration proclaims that all citizens are to be guaranteed the rights of liberty, property, security and resistance to oppression. Now let's come to some of the landmark articles of the Declaration. Men are born and remain free and equal in rights. This again is taken from the American Declaration. Social distinctions may be founded only upon the general good. Now this is an interesting clause. It says social distinctions are not permitted but they may be founded upon only the general good. Some might say that this is in conflict with the fact that men are born free and equal. But the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen was pragmatic and said that there might be instances where certain distinctions may be necessary. And of course, this brings to mind the concept of slavery, which was still prevalent in the sister nation of the United States of America. But that was based on a misconception of the general good and consequently, with the passing of the Civil Rights Act, that anomaly was remedied. The aim of all political association is the preservation of the natural and imprescriptible rights of man. These rights are liberty, property, security and resistance to oppression, declares the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. The Declaration also states, the principle of all sovereignty resides essentially in the nation. Nobody or no, no body or no individual may exercise any authority which does not proceed directly from the nation. Again, emphasizing that if you have to deprive somebody of their right to life, that must have a collective sanction of the people through parliament or through the sovereign. Now let's come to the Geneva Convention. Those of you who like war films will have heard of the Geneva Convention. In 1864, 16 European countries and several American states attended a conference in Geneva at the invitation of the Swiss Federal Council on the initiative of the Geneva Committee. This diplomatic conference was held for the purpose of adopting a convention for the treatment of wounded soldiers in combat. Europe until 1864 had been plagued with wars and of course the two most bloody, most unfortunate and brutal wars, the First World War and the Second World War, was still a half a century or so away. Therefore, it is some consolation that when the two, the Great War and the, and the Second World War erupted, the Geneva Convention was in place. What does the Geneva Convention state? The main principles laid down in the Convention and maintained by the later Geneva Conventions provided for the obligation to extend care without discrimination to the wounded and sick military personnel 
and respect for and marking of medical personnel transports and equipment with the distinctive sign of the Red Cross on a white background. Therefore, these are the terms of engagement, the rules of war under the Geneva Convention. If you capture an enemy combatant, he will be known as a POW, a prisoner of war. He will be treated in a manner that you would treat your own military personnel. If he is wounded, you will give him care. If he is sick, you will take care of him. You will give him the best care that is available. Another principle of the Geneva Convention is that medical assistance that is being offered by the Red Cross and organizations such as the Red Cross will not be attacked and will be allowed to perform their duties. Now let's come to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and see what this declaration has to say on the right to life. Article 1 expresses the idea of fraternity. Article 2 expresses the idea of equality. Article 3 expresses the idea of liberty. Article 3 sets forth the basic principle which is defined and elaborated in the articles that follow. Let's look at the wording of Article 3 of the UDHR. Like most of the other provisions in the Declaration, Article 3 describes the legal position of the individual as an inherent right rather than as a reflex of a state obligation to not interfere with the integrity of an individual. Your right to life under the UDHR is an innate right and it is not something that is given to you by the state. It is something you are born with and it is not something that the state cannot interfere with. It is something the state has no right to interfere with. A general topic that characterized the negotiations when the drafting of Article 3 was taking place was that Article 3 should also include the duties of the state and what the state should do to promote an individual's right to life. Let's now come to Article 3 and the deliberations on Article 3, the right to life, liberty and security of person. Article 3 gives everyone the right to life, liberty and security of person. At an earlier stage of deliberations, the right to life and liberty was qualified with the phrase except in cases prescribed by the law or after due process. Again, at an earlier stage, Article 3 of the UDHR was willing to recognize exceptions to the right to life and situations where the right to life could be taken away, but only the if due process was followed, something that I have already explained to you. Dr. F. R. Binnenfield, a Jewish stalwart of the, a stalwart of the Jewish community, speaking for the World Jewish Congress, pointed out that the clause did not specify what the nature of the law is, which he felt was a dangerous omission. He was referring here to the Nazi regime. Essentially, all the laws passed in the Nazi, Nazi regime essentially had the sanction of the people. It had a sanction of the sovereign. It qualified on a strictly textual interpretation, a literal interpretation as law, as due process. Essentially, if you are a person belonging to the Jewish faith, under the Nazi regime, you had absolutely no rights. Dr. Benenfield felt that under the Nazi regime, thousands were deprived of the right to liberty under laws that were perfectly valid, as I've just said. Primarily as a result of the doctor's plea, the qualifying state reference was dropped, essentially. Why? The members of the Human Rights Commission knew about the honor, uh, horror horrors perpetrated by the Nazi state in and outside of the concentration camps. The Secretariat had prepared a special report that had essentially described most of the war crimes. Pertinent to Article 3's right to life and liberty, as the report said, was the policy which was in existence in Germany by the summer of 1940 when Hitler was in power, under which all aged, insane and incurable people were transferred to special institutions where they were killed. Most of the 2,75,000 people killed in this way, in nursing homes, asylums and hospitals, had been German citizens. So this was the context for the deliberations on Article 3. This, this information 
inspired amendments which are not adopted but which show that the war experience lies just below the text of Article 3. The Chilean delegation, for example, also proposed an amendment that unborn children, fetuses essentially, mentally defective and lunatics shall have the right to life. The Cuban delegation wanted to add the right to personal integrity, where terrible events had taken place during the war when human beings had been used as surgical experiments. The other delegates thought that this idea was already included in the security of a person. The delegation from Uruguay, for example, proposed that the right to one's honour be added. This right is included in Article 12. Recounting the experiences of the cheapness of life at the hands of the Nazis, the Belgian delegate said that it was more than necessary to affirm the right of life, as the right had been so gravely violated by the Nazis. Now let's look at the hypocrisy of the Western world, as the Russian delegate, the USSR delegate Pavlov put it. It stands to reason that it was not just the Nazi atrocities that fed into the reiteration of the right to life and liberty. Life was cheap to others too. In our own country, we've experienced colonialism and instances such as Jallianwala Bagh were all too common. In the third session of the commission and in the third committee, deliberations, Pavlov, the USSR delegate, attacked the British colonial policies and he made reference to the lynching of African Americans in the United States and the horrors that had been perpetrated against them for hundreds of years. Christopher Mayhew, a UK delegate, responded with a long statement about Russian concentration camps set up by Stalin. So there was some to and fro between the Western world and the Eastern bloc led by the USSR. But at the end of the day, the right to life was enshrined in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. It's interesting to recount a quote by Christopher Mayhew, who explains the need that the Human Rights Commission, the Committee, the United Nations, all of them felt to pass, to reiterate rather, the right to life. The war, I quote, the war had taught the world a terrible lesson. Germany had proved that it was possible for a totalitarian state to conceal its own activities from its own population and even its officials and that once a state resorted to police methods, it could no longer stop. The right to life, the right to life which pre prevented arbitrary arrest and detention, arbitrary deprivations of life and liberty is one such safeguard against the horrors of the Nazi regime ever being perpetrated again in the future. So students, we now come to the end of this module. Let's quickly recap what we've learned. This module has sought to introduce you, the student, to some of the landmark events in human history that help shape an individual's inalienable right, inalienable right to life and personal liberty. It all began with the Magna Carta. And then we looked at the American Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights in the US Constitution, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, which all reiterated the right to life. Following the horrors of the Nazi regime and the two world wars, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, once and for all, put the issue of the right to life to rest and said that each individual has an innate right to life, liberty and security of person. What began with the Magna Carta culminated with the express recognition by several member states of the United Nations. All men and women have the right to life.